You know what, guys? I've been doing some thinking. And it's been a while since we got some juicy free-for-all action in. And for that, I apologize. So, let's rectify that today as we plunge into the fighting pits of the Great Arena, a temple dedicated to Cain, Lord of Murder. This map was made by Bloody Hound, and it is the perfect place to drown your enemies in a tide of their own blood, and beat the crap out of your friends and rivals in a gladiator pit meant for war. I've always been in love with the work our modding community puts out. They're awesome. This one is no different. If I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times. Maps maketh multiplayer. They can make for some visually stunning matches, and this one certainly qualifies. So in the blue corner, the High Elves of Ulthwan, looking splendid and regal with Dry Rain's reskins, which we'll be using for all the factions in this battle, and the Fireborn and Flamespire Phoenix should provide some heat for this cold, desolate wasteland. While the rat men of the Under Empire swarm and scurry beneath the feet of their abominations, led by Tredge Craventail and Clan Rictus. The Knights of the Ebon Claw, Malice Darkblade's own dread vanguard, are here, looking mighty fancy in red and black armor, under the wings of Seraphon and Malekith, and Lady Silastra Deerfan and her giant king crab have joined the party as well. So, the High Elves, Dark Elves, Skaven, and Vampire Coast have all shown up to play, and we've got quite a battle brewing on our hands, so let's get into it. And I started this game thinking I'd have a nice, casual stroll into the main plaza of the arena. Just kind of chilling out, hanging out, waiting for my bolt throwers to start counter-sniping enemy artillery. And then all of a sudden, out of the forest on both my flanks, who let the dogs out? Who did that? Please explain why the angriest pack of doggos ever decided to jump on me. And they've all got gold chevrons, and there are a lot of them. A clowny ass ambush to get this game kicked off. And they're gonna go right for my bolt throwers and quickly chomp on them. And I had my Fireborn a little bit ready. They were actually in a decent position to go charge them into the flank. And they're getting blobbed up like crazy right now. And you think like, this is a completely stupid tactic. I mean, you're gonna kill the bolt throwers and you're gonna die. And to an extent, that's true. But when you've got gold chevrons on these guys, they actually cut and they're operating these huge blobs. They actually do quite a bit of damage. And so you would think I'd jump out to this massive lead at the start, like he's just sacrificing all these dogs. And I am going to jump out to an early lead, but they're quickly going to kind of start equalizing a bit as he retreats. And he actually gets quite a few points from this dire pack ambush. Was it used well? Hell no. It's blobbed up. He's taking a ton of damage. He is feeding some points to me. But it was a hilarious start to the game, and I was not expecting it. And it does mean that my bolt thrower now cannot snipe out his queen best, which will now unleash from afar and really start putting a whooping on my Lothurn Sea Guard and my archers and some of my high value stuff. I've got Sword Masters, I have Phoenix Guard, the Keepers of the Flame, Fireborn, which are almost immune to the queen best, and Earthshaker gonna land right in the middle of that formation and pancake it. And the queen best and the Vampire Coast in general, super good in these kind of battles. Free for all is where Vampire Coast really shines because you don't necessarily have to attack them and that really allows their artillery to completely shine and take over battles. And they have a lot of ways to generate value from really far away and get a lot of points with really powerful artillery from the Necrofex Colossus, from the Queen Bess, all that. Shifting over here, you got the Dark Elves and Skaven, some Death Runners and an Assassin leading the pack charging in there with that awesome dry rain reskin. They really do look fantastic. Highly recommend you pick those up if you've never seen them before on the mod workshop. But the Doomfire Warlocks have gotten into the back of the Skaven artillery here, shutting down a lot of the Warp Lightning Cannon crew early, but the Death Runners will overlap the engagement as Soul Blight goes down. That will debuff a lot of the fighting right there, but they're gonna get a nice charge. Kill a lot of the Doomfire Warlocks and generate quite a few points for themselves as the Skaven slings fire backwards and the Gutter Runners and all that start doing damage that way. And of course, the inexorable horde of the Dark Elves. It's gonna be scary. Malekith has backup. He's got Seraphon on the wings. He's got another Black Dragon. The Blades of the Blood Queen, those high-level Regiment of Renown uh, Dark Shards, uh, Charybdis, and he also has the Knights of the Ebon Claw, which we saw earlier. Look at those Blades of the Blood Queen. Look at that skin. They look so sexy, beautiful. They're gonna shot through stuff pretty easy. One of the best elite infantry units in the game. And with the Charybdis, they're going to have a lot of tools for dealing with anti-large stuff as well. Blackguard and Nagarond and a Charybdis together could take down pretty much any large target in the game easily, without even much of a problem whatsoever. And here, the Vampire Coast, the Zombie Pirates, you might have been able to tell from the beginning of this match that Doggo would have a kind of strange build, and he is playing very true to his name right now. He has a lot of dogs and a very silly build. He's got about 10 mortars and an entire line of zombie halberds, which 
Not the worst idea ever, honestly. It's an incredible firepower, especially when you're considering that extra powder ability. But look at what kind of limp dick shot that was from the Queen Best. That is from the fire resistance, I believe, from the Fireborn. They have 70% of that, so that did almost no damage whatsoever. I don't even think it killed a model there. Maybe like one or two. But it did, all, it did almost nothing as it landed right, impacted right in the middle of their formation. And here come the Dark Elves and the Skaven. They are going to have their first big fight of the game and a huge sulfuric breath arcing out it's gonna carve a path of destruction right through those plague monks and that's why the black dragon breath is so good the ones that have a lot more line coverage are gonna be really good against horde factions like the skaven the star dragon breath is obviously still gonna be good against it but not quite as good as the sun dragon moon dragon or the black dragon because those have a little bit more line coverage when they unleash that breath attack and we just saw a doom bolt rain down malekith moving around on the flank maybe trying to get another one of his off warp lightning cannon's gonna fire in and that black dragon in the center is gonna hurt not gonna feel too good fighting that entire Skaven army by himself, but might be able to escape. And he is making it blob up, and it's actually not the worst tactic ever because we got a Blade Wind coming down, and he is forcing the Skaven to get all blobbed up there. And Dino will punish Tim pretty heavily there. The very nice Blade Wind, a little bit too focused on that Black Dragon trying to take it down early. He's gonna get about 150 kills from that single cast from the Vortex. So out on this side, Lothar and Seaguard shifting outwards to maybe do a little bit of skirmishing early on, but quickly gonna realize that going out wide really isn't gonna help me here. I need to pull everything into the center to focus on that front line of zombie halberds, but we're a little bit far away from that battle right now. So shift back over and we still got Malekith. It looks like a Howling Warp Gale gonna go down and we'll freeze him in place while in the center, the Hellebrona, <laughs> so sick, bro. We're gonna be fighting with Charybdis, and look at that animation, that is so cool. Gonna pick up a Skaven and actually rip him in half. Crucified him, dude, between the fanged mouse of that abyssal monster. Death stalks the Ratmen, and the Charybdis with that abyssal howl will imbue a pretty large leadership penalty in the center. And the Skaven have jumped out to an early lead, and this approach, man, this is going to suck some serious sack. This is not gonna be fun. I mean, we're running directly into mortar fire from on high and all that artillery power. None of it has been shot anywhere else, which means that extra 30% missile damage and artillery damage, flaming damage, explosive damage, all that damage is all coming my way. And it means that very few of my units that are running into melee right now are going to have their martial prowess buff when they finally make it. And that's one of the things that makes the high elf so powerful is the beginning stages of their engagements are what really make them strong in a fight. And if that's gone, then trading with those zombies and cutting through all that HP on ultra unit size is not gonna be a very easy thing. So I have to do something to turn it in my favor. One of the ways to do that, of course, is to kind of notice that they don't have a lot of mobility because they are undead zombies. And we're going to fly over the top. Flamespire Phoenix will go for the back line, trying to shut down some of those mortars early on. And the Star Dragon unleashing that laser breath into the Queen Bast and Silastra as well. But a Kraken's pull from the Crab Lady in the middle of my army, and that's gonna hurt. Swordmaster is feeling it for sure. Gonna get tentacle whipped. Seen enough hentai to know where this one's going. And yeah, they're dead. I mean, a lot of them are just dying outright right now. More mortar fire coming in. Brutal stuff. Not having a good time, but them killing the monsters is not gonna be very easy for the Vampire Coast as they summon some of their damned questing knights or knights errant rather. They don't have any speed, so the Star Dragon and my Flamesfire Phoenixes can use their mass and kind of take the engagements they want. And I can do the same with my Dragon Princes, who are fighting out on the flank and destroying the rest of those scurvy dogs who were very annoying at the start of that match. And I am in second place right now, Skaven in third, and Vampire Coast with all that mortar fire has actually jumped out to the number one spot while Seraphon terror routing some of the artillery crews in the back lines and the Executioners and the Dark Elf Rush in the thick of it now and that's the engagement they want for sure they can tear through that game in front line no problem whatsoever getting text messages i'm incredibly popular and that's a nice charge up the center from the knights errant and net of avatar going down from techless and guess why this is going to be a bad fight for the undead bretonians on the vampire coast keepers of the flame have magical attacks so they're going to shred them nicely and now silastra no longer having a good time. That giant crab about to be a tasty snack. Add some butter sauce on top of that thing because the giant crab is about to go down and there are a few things more delectable 
than steamed Alaskan King Crab. And there's a lot of meat in there too. I mean, I guess it's rotten, but I don't know if Star Dragons actually care about that. It's dead. The Flamespire Phoenix and the Star Dragon Goon Squad. More than enough to bring her down. And they'll have plenty to feast on after this battle. And that summon cavalry, they were pinned. And now they're fighting, I mean, some of the best halberd units in the game that happen to have magical attacks. So hard counter for sure there. And crab summons charging forward as the mortars continue to rain down. And continue to just drop a pounding on the Azur line. And the vampire coast is still in front. But it's very even right now. It looks like a help and abomination. Uh, kind of got thrown to the wolves in the middle of the Black Guard of Nagarond and that Charybdis nearby. Pretty sure that's what took it down. And yeah, I mean, a Hell Pit, it's a great monster. It actually has plenty of uses. Sometimes can completely carry a battle for you with Terror and its melee output. But when it's fighting a Charybdis and Black Guard, it's just never going to be a good time. Another big breath attack coming in from the Black Dragon and Tretch Craven Tail dropping that Verminous Valor in the middle of everything. It's probably like the coolest spell in the game that does no damage. I mean, just seeing everything around him just blow up like he just went Super Saiyan 3. Super cool. But we've got a Help It A-Bomb and a Black Dragon fight. They're going at it right now. And if we're lucky, we might get some custom animations here. And we are. Yes, dude. Oh my god, that looks so sick. I, I'm so glad they took the time to iron out those animations and make them look good. I mean, occasionally that kind of stuff will glitch out, but it is so worth it seeing gigantic monsters go at it and not just swing wildly at the air. Sometimes they'll actually sync up and do cool stuff like that. And that is just so much fun to watch. And maybe we'll get it again. I mean, there's some really cool ones between the Hell Pit and the Black Dragon. They actually showed it off for the first time, I think, in the Skaven trailer when the uh, Black Dragon was fighting the Hell Pit there. But yeah, there's some really cool stuff. In the back, we've got Flamespire Phoenix on Overwatch right now, dropping some bombs, thinking about going into melee soon. And Phoenix Guard should be able to hold this line forever. I mean, you could throw zombie pirates at them in perpetuity and it wouldn't be enough to bring them down. They've got, the, what, like 65 melee defense? It's just an obscene stat line. You can carve through these guys for days, and they will do so. So, I have actually jumped in the first place right now, but barely. Barely winning. A Hell Pit Abomination getting double teamed from the front and the back, and some more unique animations playing. Get on the Haymaker 1-2 combo, but even though Too Horrible to Die just proc, he's gonna get a bunch of health back, he will run. If I was the dragons there, I'd probably chase him down to make sure that that help it does not come back to the fight. Because if he's able to link up with the rest of the army, it might do some serious damage there. But the Dread Knights into the fight now. Knights of the Ebon Claw fighting near Tretch, who does have that bonus force large and a ton of melee defense. So they'll probably never kill him. Verminous Valor going off again. Blades of the Blood Queen helping to support. Clan Rats will die very quickly in this kind of fight. But Tretch does have the support of a Plague Priest. And a couple of heroes, a Warlock Engineer, thrown in there for good measure. So, dealing with that as the Dread Knights might not be the easiest thing in the world. And everything over there is pretty beaten up. But it looks like the Dark Elves are in the Ascendancy for now. But Skaven are going to retreat, use that scurry away, and uh, kind of show off their Verminous Valor themselves. As the Azur Spearmen fight against the Death Runners from behind. And the Assassin, they snuck all the way around the map and got into the back of the High Elf line, and that was the last thing I wanted to deal with right now, because I had more than my hands full dealing with all those vampire pirates and all that artillery fire that just completely destroyed me on the way in, and now I've got assassins to worry about in the back. Now, thankfully, I have the tools to deal with it, right? My Dragon Princes and my Flyers are still in great shape, and that means I can do some serious work against this contingent back here, but that does mean my Spearmen are going to take a beating and... It might be a good time to drop some bombs, drop some fiery bird poop from on high, and that'll do some nice damage for sure. Death Runners have pretty low armor, and from what I understand, the Flamespire Phoenix bombs are much better against kind of blobbed up infantry that don't have very high mass or very high armor. And so if we're able to get some good bombs in there, which we just did, they're already down to about half HP, and the Fireborn and the other unit of DP is coming back and we're going to be looking to get some hammer and anvils, maybe some tear routing going on, and uh, finish off those guys for good. So, a decent idea on the attack there, but as he's microing on the other side of the field, kind of hard to do that, and it might just end up throwing me points, which I'm completely cool with. And we're going to get a beautiful shot of these Fireborn running down their enemies. And on the open field, this is a nightmare for Clan Ashen. This is not where they want to be. 
They have no real way to escape from this. Uh, it'd be kind of cool, actually, if Death Hunters had, besides their stealth bomb, if they had a smoke bomb, too, to slow down enemies, because it feels like it would fit thematically really well. And maybe like a 75% like a speed slow when they drop that smoke bomb to prevent charges coming in on them. Might be good, but might make them a little bit too strong. Not sure. But it would definitely be thematic and be very useful for them right now. Because without it, I mean, it's just Star Dragon feasting time. And Dragon Prince is going to really enjoy the fight out there. On this side, Help It Abomination running down those poor Blades of the Blood Queen. And they might be the best infantry versus other infantry in the game. But at the end of the day, they're fighting a Help It. The monster from Clan Mulder. And he wants none of it. And with the support from Trash Craventail and those heroes, those Blades of the Blood Queen are not going to be long for this world. Charging back in one more time bravely, but it is all for naught. The Warpstone Fist will grind them into oblivion, and we're going to see some more Haymakers from that thing as well. Imagine that mewling mass just crushing you into the stone floors of the arena. Not a fun way to go. Not a good way to die at all. Probably the most terrifying monster in Warhammer Fantasy. I shudder to think what it would be like to actually face that thing down in real life. On this side, the Vampire Coast is cleared up. The Skaven are being run down. The Flamespire Phoenix is getting some tasty snacks. And the Death Runners are running for the hills. One of them might escape, but the rest of them, this Fireborn unit, look at that kill count. That is obscene. That is serious damage output. And they've had free reign on the battlefield so far. Now, to be fair, plenty of those kills have come on lower tier units. But really gorgeous to see that stat line. And the Dark Elves getting some good shots with the Reaper Bolt Throwers into the Horde. As Skaven try to get around. And they don't want to be attacking from the same location. They are using those walls of the arena for cover. And even though the Reaper Bolt Throwers will still be able to shoot them, the Dark Shards are not in range yet. And so... Right now, as the Assassin runs forward to try to link up with Malekith, you can see something kind of brewing here for the Druki as they get some good shots into the Azur lines as well. You start thinking, hey, you got the High Elves on one side, you got the Skaven on the other side. Everybody hates Dark Elves. They're a bunch of douchebags. How about we murder them in their own home turf? And so as I attack from the front, Skaven will be going in from the back, and Dino is going to have his hands full dealing with two armies, but... He does have the strongest army left right now, by far. Now, the Star Dragon and the Flamespire Phoenixes are in good shape, and the Fireborn are as well. We have Regrowth, which I've kind of glossed over this battle, but Techless and that healing, I mean, there's just so many important targets to heal this battle. Can't heal them all, but with the Star Dragon, definitely that's the number one priority because you get so much value out of that, but also on the Fireborn, who have gotten to Regrowth their way as well. Just a lot of healing, and it's allowed me to kind of stay in this fight even though I took a ton of damage against that Vampire Coast army. And we're going in now. Kadai and Sitharai are going to get quite a few new souls coming their way. So Nash probably will also, as the Black Guard and the Executioners come in. But we've got Aerial Superiority, which is a big deal, because Malekith and the Black Dragon are still alive, which means those are points that are decently likely to go my way, because outrunning a Star Dragon might not be simple. He has to commit to running away if he does not want to die. we got some nice bombs going down on top of the Executioners, carving out a nice little chunk in the center of their formation. But I look at the Black Dragon, I just say, and Malekith too, like, hey, if I can kill him now, I'm gonna get a lot of points. Let's do that. And that will force the other Black Dragon to come over and support as the Dread Knights charge forward. The Black Guard get in there as well. Those poor High Elf Spearmen are about to have the worst day of their miserable lives. And the aerial fight, definitely going the way of the High Elves. I mean, there are few factions in the game that can deal with that kind of aerial superiority. The Star Dragon's no joke, even though he doesn't have spell support right now. Doesn't really matter when you've got two Flames Power Phoenixes and Black Dragon will plummet to the earth. But Malekith did escape as the Dread Knights stay in there. They do not want to stick around fighting Keepers of the Flame. Probably the best Halberd unit in the game, or certainly one of them anyway. There's no Black Guard Regiment of Renown. Nice Chain Lightning on top of some pretty high value infantry. And a Star Dragon Breath, Strawberry Milkshake into the center of the Executioners and the Dread Spears and chunking them down to half HP as the Charge charges forward. And that Abyssal Howl ringing out will cause some terror on the High Elf line. But a Star Dragon 
And the support of the Flame Spires might be enough as we get a Fiery Convocation Down Spell from Teclas, the brother of Tyrion, defender of Ulthuan, and arcing through the enemy formation now, burning them to cinder. Beautiful. And we got a big monster mash too. Again, the Goon Squad doing some work right now. Another regrowth going down. Look at how much damage the Star Dragon took fighting that Charybdis in only a couple of attacks. Took him down to about a third HP and only a few swings of those huge fanged mouths. But the Eternal Flame Keeper people stuff, Phoenix Guard, Halberd stuff, <laughs> they're dying. They're getting run over. But the Dragonborn, Dragonborn, Jesus. Dovahkiin, Fuzroda, charging forward, and they will finish off that Charybdis. And that's more points going my way. So I've got a commanding lead right now, but it's not over because from my personal experience, Whoever is the last one standing in any free-for-all is going to win on like nine times out of ten. And that means we need to do a lot more killing and we need to make sure that we're the last ones alive if we want to pull this one out. Fireborn getting a nice charge. Star Dragon getting an even meaner one. Just spewing crimson everywhere. That is a sacrifice to Cain. The Lord of Murder will very much enjoy painting his arena red. And those Dark Shards don't really have anywhere to run. Cav are going to have free reign here. Dark Elves got smushed in between the Skaven and the High Elves, which is kind of what I wanted, to be honest, because the Dark Elves were going to give me a lot of trouble, and honestly, the Skaven took off a lot of pressure from me, so big props to Tim there, because I might have been able to pull out a win in that fight against the Dark Elves 1v1, but it would have been tough, and with the Skaven coming in from behind with that Hell Pit and Tretch and the Assassin Squad, it took some pressure off on me for sure. Got some kills on the Dark Shards and allowed my Cav to get in there and really put the pain into the Druki. The Star Dragon is doing the exact same thing. He's on a field day today. Knight Assassin, I don't know if he's done a whole lot. We haven't really focused on him because I think he had zero kills before that initial fight and I don't think he's done anything since. I, I've never really liked Assassins, honestly. Like, the idea of the unit is so cool, but in practice you can't really give them strength 10 weapon I believe that's how it worked on tabletop. You could hide them in a formation and then strike out and, like, like just eviscerate a lord or hero. And it's very hard for them to do that in this game because of the way stock works, which is unfortunate. Skaven Assassin is very good. K9 Assassin can definitely work, but in my experience, I don't know. I don't, I don't have a lot of a lot of success with them, honestly. But Skaven have gotten some good Howling Warp Gales on Malekith. That's actually the second one they've landed in as many minutes. And he's pinned to the ground. And that lets Tresh and some of the Skaven units just kind of wail on him for a bit. Malekith and Seraphon kind of getting beat up. Tackless bowling over some dudes. And I did bring the Sword of Tackless with him. So I can get that 60% weapon damage increase and higher AP and all that. Kind of turn him into a decent melee combatant. And Star Dragon roaring his fury to the heavens. And will snack him. Smash him. Smash him one more time. And swallow. Well, we got to make toast him up nicely first. Another regrowth going down. And yeah, that's been... <laughs> yeah, at the end of the day, yes, you're feeding more points that way. If they can kill a Star Dragon two or three times, you will be getting a lot more points. But at the end of the day, a lot of factions are going to have a very hard time doing that when you're able to heal them that many times. And a nice Strawberry Milkshake going right for Malekith and Tresh. And Flames Pirate Phoenix is going in too. And again, the Goon Squad. It's been important. It's been impactful. They've killed some high-value lords, and Malekith will go down. Seraphon collapsing into an undignified heap. And Malekith nearby. Tretch just like, Hi, guys. What's going on? I'm going to score you away now. Peace. And he just runs away. <laughs> he was literally under the wing of that dragon. Just kind of like runs out of nowhere. What the hell just happened? And he's going to start running for the hills. He's actually... Actually, I don't think he's actually broken yet. Those guys are... And uh, they're not coming back. Bolt thrower sniping out the blades of the Blood Queen. So at this point, it will be insurmountable for both the Dark Elves and the Skaven. I think my lead is a little bit too high for them to win. But the Black Guard will unfortunately kill off the remnants of my beautiful defenders. And as they make their last stand, they will explode and try to bring down as many as they can. And he exploded, and then his head landed on the ground. Rip! Ur Runes, my friend, you fought bravely and to the last man. That's how crazy their leadership is. They will actually fight to the last. They're not even unbreakable, but what, what is it, like 120 leadership? They don't route, ever. <laughs> and Tretch died. Uh, we missed that, my bad. And Teclas and the Flamespire 
We just have to look for the remaining unit. So, as the Black Guard are carved apart by the remaining Bolt Thrower, one of them did survive that initial doggo attack, which was fun. We're gonna do some more flaming poops on top of them. And I was actually testing out, because I wasn't 100% sure. Do Flame Spire Phoenix Bombs give points? I don't know if you guys remember it, but when Free For All first came out, there were some spells and abilities. Um, Comet of Cassandora, good example, that would not give you points. Gyro Bombs would not give you points or even count as kills on the Gyro Bomber's kill counter, which is really stupid. That's been a problem since game one. I don't know if that's been fixed yet, honestly. But these do, the uh, Flaming Bird Poops do count as points when you land them, which is cool. You don't get a lot. And in fact, I'm not 100% sure yet if it gives you all the points. It might just give you points for the kills and not for the damage. I'd actually have to test it more. It seemed like this wasn't giving me a whole lot of points. And it's an expensive unit. I mean, 950 gold for the Death Runners. They're pretty expensive. But uh, either way, we're going to tear out them. And that will basically be your battle. So, look. That kind of thing, it's why I love Free For All. I don't care if I win or lose in those games. As long as I don't get like double teamed at the start and die instantly. I always have fun in Free For All. Because it is madness. It is over-the-top madness from beginning to end. Look at those Fireborn. 500 kills. Makes me so happy. I mean, I love Dragon Princes. One of my favorite cab units. And I love cab units. Like, you can't ask for more than that from any unit. 500 kills. But they were far from the only unit that kicked ass. I mean, regular Dragon Princes. 461. My Star Dragon got two Silver Chevrons. My regular Dragon Princes got one Silver Chev. My Phoenix Guard, Keepers of the Eternal Flame, 180 kills. And then going to the other factions, Malachite, 350. I mean, from the Blade Winds and from Seraphon. Uh, the Skaven didn't have any that, like, really stood out, but he was trading really well with the Dark Elves initially. Got a ton of points early on. Kind of got dragged through the mud a bit. I mean, he just had a little bit of issue. And then Silastra and the Vampire Coast. I mean, that build was hilarious. The Dog Father, uh, memeing pretty hard and truly keeping true to his name, for sure. I don't know if I would recommend the the scurvy dog meta anytime soon. Maybe like three or four. It can be really good for hunting artillery and archers, but that many. Um, well, it's surprising because he actually jumped out to an early lead even before his main artillery started firing. So maybe they didn't do that bad, but they certainly could have been used better. Overall, it was a really fun game anyway. Hope you guys enjoyed it and more free for all and siege content coming very soon.